At Online Med Ed, we walk you through every topic in detail so you're ready for the boards and the wards. Sleep one is going to be about the physiology of sleep. You're probably not going to get very many test answers right from understanding this lesson, but it's here because it will help counsel patients on how to get better sleep and your understanding of what happens during sleep will be important as we talk about the parasomnias that come in the next lesson. That is too much sleeping or not enough sleeping. So I want to start off with the physiology, cover some vocabulary, and finish off with two disorders that are fairly common and very benign, but use them as a way to pull everything together in the way of the physiology. So let's start off with the stages of sleep. This is going to represent the awake brain. So if someone puts their head down and goes to sleep, they're going to go through a number of stages of sleep. And in order to get from one stage you have to, to another, you have to progress to the previous stage. That's N1, N2, and N3. Previously, we had stage 3 and 4, which we thought were separate stages. They've now been combined into N3 because the EEG and EMG findings are very similar. And that's actually how we define the stages of sleep is based on what we see on EEG and EMG when we hook somebody up. In order to get to the next stage, you have to go through the preceding stage. You have to go from awake to one, to two, to three, and then only after each of these three stages can you go into REM. And REM is the restful sleep. REM called REM because it is rapid eye movement on EMG. The others are non-REM sleep. REM is the most restful period where your brain engages memories, processes the day, and actually gets restful sleep. So you have to go through each stage to get to REM. And the longer you are in sleep, the shorter the duration of the non-REM sleeps and the longer the duration of REM. That is, the longer you are asleep, the more time you'll spend in REM and the more REM periods you'll have and the more restful the sleep is. Longer durations of sleep, more REM. We call these stages based on the EEG findings. This makes it for great question fodder because it's a one-to-one -one association. In stage one, what you'll see are theta waves. If you just add a bottom underline to that T, stage one, theta waves, the T of theta becomes an I. And there are absent alpha waves. Absent alpha. In stage two, what you'll see are K complexes. Notice the letter change to make the alliteration work. And sleep spindles. Stage three, delta waves. And in REM, the restful sleep, you're going to have the EEG pattern that shows an awake brain. And an EMG will show complete loss of tone. That is atonia, except for the rapid eye movements that characterize REM sleep. And a normal part of the physiology, but not necessarily required for this, diagnosing the stage, is going to be both female and male erections. The closer you are to the aroused or awake brain, the easier it is to arouse you from sleep. That is, stage one, two, and REM are very easy to arouse. You can wake the person up easily. Where someone who's in a deep sleep is difficult to arouse. And you felt this with that alarm clock. Even though you've slept eight hours, when the alarm goes off, you're really groggy and takes you a while to come to. Well, that's because you've been ripped from a deep sleep versus the, when you're having a dream and you wake up just because the sun's there, the alarm didn't even go off, you startled yourself awake. Well, it's because you're near the aroused state. The EEG pattern is the same in the awake brain and the REM brain. And then you need to memorize which of the EEG findings are associated with each of the different stages. Two vocabulary terms I want you to know about are sleep latency and REM latency. Sleep latency is the amount of time you put your head down 
to the time you actually enter stage one. That is falling asleep time. The duration it takes to actually go to sleep. This is going to be significantly increased in insomnia and decreased with sleep deprivation. If you've had a big test, you might have some anxiety and have trouble going to sleep. It takes a long time to get there. But if you've pulled an all-nighter studying for a big exam, after the test, you crash and go to sleep really easily. That's that sleep deprivation. Sleep latency is influenced by the amount of time you've had sleep and also other disease states. You need sleep, so not sleeping makes it easier to get to sleep. But you also need restful sleep. That's REM latency. The amount of time it takes from the time you've entered sleep, stage one, to get to REM. This is normally about 40 minutes, which means that if you take short naps, you're not entering REM, so you're not getting really restful sleep. Your eyes might feel better that you've closed them, but you never really engaged restful sleep. REM latency is going to be decreased in narcolepsy. We'll discuss narcolepsy in the next lesson, but you'll see they have complete loss of tone and they jump right into REM. It's also decreased in sleep deprivation or REM deprivation. Body needs sleep, body needs REM. If you take sleep or REM away, the body is going to be able to get to sleep and into REM faster. REM deprivation can occur in two major disease states, obstructive sleep apnea and alcohol use. In obstructive sleep apnea, multiple apneic periods cause a person to wake up constantly. Because you have to progress from one stage to the next, and they constantly get woken up by their apneic spells, not to full arousal, but they, get, they don't actually go through all the sleep phases, they never get to REM. And so with a reduced REM time during their sleep, they wake up unrefreshed, so they have daytime somnolence. Alcohol does decrease the sleep latency. You pass out when you drink. But unfortunately, it reduces REM also. So people who are chronically using alcohol or benzodiazepines may be going to sleep, but their sleep isn't as restful as it could be. And there's a phenomenon called REM rebound. That is the amount of REM you get significantly increases when you've deprived the body from REM sleep. You start taking the alcohol away or you give them a CPAP machine, all of a sudden they're able to get into REM and they have REM rebound, they have a lot of it. Still tested are gonna be the no transmitters and because this sand man comes to put you to sleep, we use sand as our advanced organizer. S is serotonin, A is acetylcholine, N is norepi, and D is dopamine. The problem here is that you're not gonna be able to go from sand to oh, what effect does this medication have? So we're gonna to briefly touch on this, but it's not really worth committing to memory and you don't try to use this chart to predict how medications will influence sleep. If you increase serotonin, you generally increase sleep. If you increase acetylcholine, you increase dreaming, make them more vivid. If you increase norepi or dopamine, you're gonna end up keeping the person aroused and awake. This makes sense. If you use cocaine, stimulates norepi, it's a stimulant, you stay awake. People that are having trouble sleeping because of depression, you give them an SSRI, they go to sleep. But trying to use this chart to predict how medications will influence sleep not worth doing, not worth committing to memory because it's so hyper-specific. But what I do want to talk about is another neurotransmitter called GABA. GABA is going to decrease sleep latency. It's also going to decrease non-REM sleep stage three. You can stimulate GABA with alcohol, non-specific benzodiazepines, or the newer BZD1s like Zolpidem. The problem with alcohol and benzodiazepines is that they actually cause an upregulation of GABA, such that if you remove them, there's all these excitatory transmitters, and all of a sudden you have too much excitation, which can lead to seizures. Alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal cause people to be hyper-aroused. They don't go to sleep, they're bugging out, and all of a sudden they seize. The BZD1s don't do that. The BZD1s, like Zolpidem, are gonna help people sleep. They help people get to sleep by decreasing the sleep latency, and they usually create a better sleep state by staying asleep. Benzodiazepines and alcohol should not be used to help sleep. 
because they're going to, one, become dependent, and two, you may actually reduce the amount of REM sleep they get. Right? So alcohol and benzodiazepines, the problem here is that they have a decreased REM sleep. Even though they're getting too sleep, they're not having restful sleep. And if you remove those, just as you can kind of have an excitation, so till you have a REM rebound. Okay, two more disorders I want to talk about. That's nightmares and night terrors. Nightmares are dreams gone bad. And because they are dreams, the person will be in REM, which means they'll have no tone. But the patient being in REM sleep is near the aroused state, so it's easy to wake up from this. So the person will awake, and they will remember. They remember that they just had a dream. They may not immediately recognize, well, that was a dream, but as they wake up in their room, they're like, oh, I was dreaming. It's okay, that wasn't real. This can happen at any age. And you'll see why I'm doing this as we talk about night terrors. The diagnosis is clinical, and in general, nightmares don't require any treatment. But you should reduce whatever stressor there is in their life that's causing these nightmares. If the person, however, is having nightmares as a product of PTSD, it's their flashback, and the PTSD does need to be treated, and you should treat the PTSD with an SSRI and psychotherapy. But because it occurs in REM, the patients who don't like their nightmares and their flashbacks may figure out if they drink, they can reduce their nightmares by using alcohol or benzos. And so they self-medicate with the wrong medications. Don't use alcohol and benzodiazepines to suppress nightmares. Engage the stressor that's inducing them instead. Night terrors are a board favorite because they're so easy to spot. The patient is in non-REM stage three. And so these are more than dreams. These are just active behaviors while asleep. The patient, because they're in stage three, has tone. And it appears to everyone else that they have awoken. So I put in parentheses, awake. But they don't remember because they were not actually awake. This is a kid who sits up screams, maintains tone, but is inconsolable. The parents freak out because it looks like the kid's having this traumatic experience, and the kid goes to sleep and he doesn't remember that it even happened. The parents will complain about this about their child. This too is a clinical diagnosis, and most of the time the patients will outgrow it, so the treatment is going to be nothing but reassurance. Educate the parents that this is a normal thing, and to not use alcohol or benzodiazepines to induce their kid into skipping Stage three, alcohol benzodiazepines, decreased non-REM stage three, don't use alcohol or benzos to treat the child. Some other parasomnias like sleepwalking, which is a real thing. People can actually end up in the refrigerator making food and eating it or even driving while asleep. That's dangerous. And sleep talking, where the rumor about how you explain to your wife about all your mistresses while you sleep is just isn't true. It's usually mumbling. There are other parasomnias that I'm not going to engage on the board this lesson was more about the stages of sleep, recognizing the stages based on the EEG pattern, especially REM sleep with the EMG, and rapid eye movement in addition to the EEG, and then kind of understanding the influence of alcohol and benzos, and maybe a little bit about neurotransmitters. Closing off with nightmares, which are adults that remember that they were dreaming, engage the nightmare in the treatment if it's part of another disorder. Night terrors occur in kids. Parents care, kid doesn't, kid will outgrow them. That's sleep one.